Good afternoon. Uh, I hope you all made wise choices for lunch. Um, uh, this is kind of weird because as someone called me a prowler when I'm on stage, which is true, but there's this table and so does anyone want to take odds that I pull a Chevy Chase and uh, flop off the stage? Uh, so yes, I am the former uh, CEO of Weight Watchers. Uh, after about 14 years, I wrapped up uh, what was the experience of a lifetime at the end of August, and I'm gonna try to rapid fire answer a bunch of questions. Uh, do I know what I'm gonna do next? No. Uh, what are you doing right now? Traveling a lot, is that awesome? Yes. Um, and, and most recently, uh, and actually I'm, I'm gonna read you an email. This poor guy uh, is gonna regret ever having sent it to me. Uh, but this is a, a friend of mine, uh, way back a thousand years ago, I worked for a uh, management consulting firm, the Boston Consulting Group. And this uh, guy who's still at BCG was trying to make a connection between me and another BCG alum who is now the CEO of, wait for it, Arby's. Uh, and he thought it would be great for us to get together, but he sent me an email and he got the automatic reply saying I'm no longer with Weight Watchers. So he sends me back an email saying, David, just received automatic reply. What are you up to now? Must be a relief as I can imagine your old job really forced you to stay thin. <laughs> now can you relax the diet? Question mark, Carl. Uh, as another friend of mine put it to me, he said, dude, does this mean you're gonna eat so much pizza you throw up? Um, I hope it doesn't come to that. Uh, still at go weight, very proud of that fact. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time, I don't want to belabor uh, stuff that you guys already know, which is uh, you know, the, the horrors of the obesity epidemic, uh, the fact that it's not really getting any better, the fact that even if the total percentage of people are overweight and obese isn't really going up that much anymore, what you still see is an increasing shift within that group, that 70% of the population, uh, particularly into the category of people who are morbidly obese. Uh, the implications of this, you guys are all healthcare people, you know this well, is that it is a major driver of a variety of chronic diseases, most obvious example being diabetes. You also know that diabetes in this country alone is a $200 billion a year condition, that it afflicts about 26 million Americans, 11% of the population, that's double from 1970. Uh, and that's bad enough except for the fact that there's another 78 million Americans who are classified as pre-diabetic, uh, which means there's a very good probability over the next five to 15 years that they will become diabetic, which is one of the primary reasons why the CDC is forecasting that by the year 2050, one out of every three Americans will be diabetic. Uh, and you can sort of see that in kind of the, the scheme of the great uh, you know, debates on entitlement programs and healthcare costs and everything else, that this is a problem. Uh, that chronic disease incidence rates are not gonna get better, and in fact, if obesity doesn't get any worse, chronic disease will continue getting worse uh, because it is a lagging indicator of uh, our lifestyles. Uh, the reasons for it, and this starts getting a little bit more into the meat of the discussion, is uh, the, the first is people will say, well, you know, we become more sedentary as a society, and that's what's driven the obesity epidemic. Uh, most of the research is suggesting that's not really true. Uh, we've been becoming sedentary for the better part of 100 years. It's, a, it's effect, effectively a function of industrialization. Uh, and obesity really has only become an issue over the past, say, four, uh, 40 years. And what's happening more is what a lot of us are also familiar with, which is that there's been an explosion of stuff in the food industry. So there is you know, an incremental 600 calories per day per person in the food supply versus, say, 1970. Uh, and most of those extra calories that are now available are foods that are heavy in added sugars and fats, uh, otherwise known as processed food, otherwise known as, depending on your perspective, a lot of junk food. Uh, it surrounds us, we're bombarded by messages, it is the place that we live in today, it's what people in obesity circles call living in an obesogenic society. Um, if you get down to an individual level and say, well, why is it that people overeat? Uh, and this is one of the things that always makes me a little bit crazy, which is you'll hear people say, well, you just need to eat less and move more, okay. Uh, or a calorie is a calorie and it's just a function of managing calorie deficit. I wish it were that simple. 
But the, the traditional way that people thought about why we eat and why we get hungry is what they call the, uh, the homeostatic eating system, which is this, you know, nicely arranged system of hormones shuttling back and forth uh, that indicate when our body is nutrient deprived and when it's not, uh, communicating with the hypothalamus. Uh, and this is where the vast, vast, vast majority of nutritional research has focused on trying to figure out better ways to address this system, and it's yielded some good insights. It's yielded the fact that different foods have different satiety characteristics, different foods the body has to work harder to process. Uh, it has gotten into the concepts around energy density, so foods that tend to be have relatively few calories per cubic meter uh, keep us satisfied longer, and what it's really kind of shed light on is, in fact, a calorie is not a calorie, but when push comes to shove, and I always get the question, so okay, who's right? Is it low carb, is it low fat? And one of the things that's kind of awesome about giving this talk right now in my current midlife crisis context of not being affiliated with anybody is I've got nothing to sell and nothing to buy. Uh, so I will answer the question again, which is to say it doesn't really matter. Uh, when you get most of these like warriors on like the Paleo and the Atkins and the South Beach and the Ornish and the Pritikin and you get all these guys together, they inevitably say eat, Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins, watch portion size, cut out junk food, exercise daily, repeat. Like, this is your diet book. Uh, it's kind of all you really need to know. Most of us know this. Most of us know all this stuff to be true, yet we don't live this. And I think a big reason why we don't live this, and what's important if you want to have an impact on, on sort of consumer behavior, patient engagement, whatever you want to call it, you have to dig a little deeper. And sadly, the issue is our brain. Uh, it, it works against us in lots of different ways. Said differently, people eat for a thousand reasons that have nothing to do with the so-called homeostatic eating system. In fact, there's been a lot of great research on what's called the hedonic eating system. The way to think about this is imagine getting an MRI. You're someone who struggles with weight. You get an MRI of your brain while they show you pictures of ice cream. And lo and behold, your brain is lighting up like a Christmas tree. Uh, and apparently, someone was, I was just talking to someone earlier today, there's like, you know, five to 10% of the population, they do the same thing. These are like naturally skinny people. Maybe you know someone like this. Maybe you are this person. Uh, you get the same MRI, you're getting pictures of food flashed in front of your eyes, and there's literally nothing going on. Uh, and I often kind of joke that people who are naturally skinny are kind of dim-witted when it comes to appreciating food. But there's a lot even beyond this. And so this is, you know, what's going on there is it's, you know, when you're seeing food, the highly palatable food, you're actually having chemical reaction, you're getting a dopamine release, uh, and it is pleasurable. Or even more importantly, you know, you'll hear people talk about emotional eating. Well, what is that? Well, when I'm stressed, when I'm anxious, when things aren't going well, as a human, I don't particularly like feeling that way. I feel vulnerable. Uh, I'm not happy. I'm gonna look for something to dull that sensation. I may have a drink, I may smoke a cigarette, or I might have a bowl of ice cream. Pick your poison. And you get that routinized enough and it becomes kind of a habit. And it goes into your habit pathways. And then next thing you know, we find ourselves eating for no particular reason. Then we have to deal with stuff like, there's this great research by a guy named Brian Wansick out of Cornell University. Some of you may be familiar with him basically showing that the average person makes between 200 to 200 in food decisions every single day. And you might be thinking, well, how is that possible, particularly since the average person can only recall about 10 to 15 food decisions. And the reason is, is that when you're sitting in a conference room, and every time you see that croissant, that muffin, whatever it is, you look at it, some guy's giving you a PowerPoint presentation, you want to kill yourself, you're thinking the muffin looks pretty good, no, I really shouldn't. Then you go back and you're having this internal monologue again and it goes and it goes and it goes and then you break and then you get the muffin. Um, and this is the nature of kind of what people are dealing with and it's a function of being in kind of the food environment we are. And the, the reason I like to talk about this stuff is that the reasons for why people overeat are incredibly complex. It's deeply ingrained. This is not rational man at his best. This is food, it gets a hold on us. When we start compulsively eating, and I say this as a guy who is a Weight Watchers member, 
like, and I, I will say this until you know, my last breath, is that if you have a weight issue, you always have a weight issue. It may be under control, but it never really goes away. And it will be something you struggle with all the time, and you're living in a food environment where you will be sort of forced into temptation zones all the time. And I worry that there's this great tendency to radically oversimplify the difficulty of somebody who's going through this process. Um, so to that end, the underlying drivers of why we overeat are kind of multifaceted and complex. Behavior change is tough to do on a good day. So people say, well, it's just like adopting a healthy lifestyle. Well, what is that? A healthy lifestyle is a compendium of healthy habits. Well, what's a habit? Something you don't have to think about. Exercising every day is something you don't have to think about anymore. It's just simply what you do. It's not an act of willpower. Willpower is by far the most overrated virtue when it comes to getting people to deal with weight issues because they always lose. We can't keep playing this game anymore. We have to find better, smarter ways of helping people rewire themselves, their environment, their world around them, and taking a different approach. And as healthcare professionals, all of you are gonna have tremendous opportunities to positively affect this, but to do so, you really have to kind of get underneath and understand why people do the things that they do. Um, one of the ways that I would kind of characterize the inherent challenge of this is just the simple recognition of procrastination. So a way to think about it is that, so this is a graph you see where it's, as age goes on, uh, somebody who's obese has a much greater likelihood of becoming diabetic than somebody who's at normal weight. The issue is, is that when you're 35 years old, your chance of becoming diabetic is just not that high. So if I'm asking you now to make a trade-off between having a blueberry muffin today or not having a muffin, but potentially staving off type 2 diabetes 20 years from now, as a human, what choice do you think you're going to make? Muffin, thank you. Um, and so this is inherent, and you know, it's kind of, a, health economists will call this myopia, uh, which is the present value of, of some benefit that's 20 years down the road ain't worth much, versus the present value of having a muffin today, which is apparently quite high. Uh, the good news though, if so this is a lot of gloom and doom stuff, the good news from my perspective is that we're not talking about making skinny people. That's not what this is about. We're talking about getting people to medically significant weight loss, which is, you're calling 10%. So in other words, for somebody who is obese, who has their weight drop by 10% and sustains it, they will reduce their likelihood of becoming, diabe uh, becoming diabetic by about 60%. So this is not about putting people on the cover of People magazine. This is about having people get to achievable and sustained moderate weight loss. Part of the problem with this is that the weight industry is so commingled with, you know, kind of its historic roots, which is people wanting to feel beautiful. Uh, and then that's these media-fueled images of what is beauty and it's super thin and everything else, and which sets people up for unreasonable expectations of what they can achieve as opposed to thinking about a BC in a health lens, which is much more focused on sustained, moderate improvements. Uh, how to actually help people deal with the weight issue? I mean, you can bucket it. Uh, it's a function of education, uh, you know, behavior change techniques, uh, habit development techniques, these types of things, uh, inner motivation, external motivation. Let me talk about inner motivation, uh, particularly for all of you health tech H2O type people. Um, one of the most interesting pieces of research I saw was that we did a study when I was at Weight Watchers back in 2002 where they looked at what is the difference between people who have success in the program and people that don't have success in the program? What are the things that are most predictive? And the answer came down to people who believe that if I simply do this program and stick with it, I'll be successful are usually successful. People who believe I failed so many times before I'm probably gonna fail again, but I owe it to myself to try, will most likely fail. And the difference between those two states is what's called self-efficacy. Self-belief, however you wanna think about it. And the problem is, is I would find myself giving these speeches in front of Weight Watchers members and they would say, well, what if I don't have any of that? What if I don't have any of this self-efficacy stuff you're talking about? What if I don't actually believe? And this is where the value of human contact comes into play that we find that when you're with other people that are going through the same thing, you're more likely to believe that you can do it. 
It's why we have organized religion. It is why human beings still value personal contact with each other because we're inherently social creatures. And that when we get together, we find that we can increase our degree of self-belief, self-efficacy, and that can ultimately make the difference between success and not success. So again, if you're thinking about how to positively affect these types of problems, you really have to kind of get underneath and say, what really has to change for me to help someone achieve this very difficult goal? If you look at methods of treatment for obesity, uh, there's one that is officially endorsed by the United States Preventive Services Task Force, that's a mouthful, to be followed by a mouthful of multi-component intensive behavioral therapy. Uh, otherwise known in shorthand as IBT, which is equally as obtuse. But nonetheless, if you look at what is IBT, it is 12 to 26 group or individual sessions, face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, lifestyle maintenance strategies, active use of self-monitoring, physical activity sessions, addressing barriers of change, improving diet, nutrition, setting weight loss goals. What do you see? Is it one single, is it, is it a rifle shot or is it a shotgun? It's a shotgun. Uh, it is a, it's, it's a whole program, it's not one individual thing, it's not one app, it's not one technique, it's not one incentive, it's a comprehensive program. The problem is, is that delivering this in a systematic way is not that easy to do. And I will say for the benefit of, of my old alma mater, Weight Watchers, this is actually what those guys do. When you look at it, I mean, it's sort of, it's tracking, it's points, it's group support, it's all these things, and they, they package it up, and in fact, they're the world's only kind of large at-scale provider of IBT. Lots of clinical data. What's interesting is that Weight Watchers does a ton of clinical data, and they did some recently that I, I want to point out, particularly given the audience, which is, this was a large uh, random clinical, uh, in-market uh, clinical trial they did that was done out of Baylor. And they looked at people that were in the Weight Watchers arm versus people that were doing own diet. And the Weight Watchers arm, predictably, uh, as it often does, did a lot better. But what was also interesting, and so if the average of the Weight Watchers arm at the end of six months was 11 pounds, the self-help group was two. What's interesting is then they said, okay, well, what about the people who went to at least half of their group support meetings? What about the people that did the, use the website at least twice a week? What about the people that use the app, say, twice a week or more? Uh, so not every day, uh, not every week in group support, but the people who did all three of those things combined lost an average of 19 pounds. Uh, not surprisingly, we find that when people are using sort of a full range of modalities of treatment, they do a lot better. This again is my point, is that when you're putting together these programs, you need to put together comprehensive programs uh, and recognize that these things tend to work uh, much better when combined. In fact, what was interesting is the thing that was most predictive of success after six months was the group support. Um, I tell people all the time when I'm talking to Weight Watchers members that there's really only two decisions you have to make uh, as someone going through an obesity treatment process. One is to start and two is to not quit. To me, this is an incredibly important point, particularly for, for an audience like this. The only thing that matters, period, is sustained engagement. You can get people who are struggling with weight to trial anything, anyhow, anytime. That's easy. I can get someone to download an app and use it for a week, no problem. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter unless you're continuing to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you're trying to come up with solutions and you're really talking about things like engagement, and you're thinking about that in a broader context around health is that nothing else matters other than keeping people motivated to do stuff over and over again. Uh, the good news is, is that there's a ton of stuff out there. The bad news is, is none of this stuff in isolation works. Uh, calorie counting apps, terrific. They make calorie counting easier. The issue is, is that who wants to keep counting calories for the rest of their life? Now I realize I'm probably with an audience of people that actually might like to keep counting calories for the rest of your life, but let's just presume that you're not the majority of the population and that most people aren't gonna continue counting calories for an extended period of time. Social media, that's great. How many people have tweeted about their weight loss efforts this week? That's what I thought. Uh, group support, works really well, people don't wanna do it. Individual support, works really well, uh, expensive. Uh, meal plans, great way to start, hard to sustain it. Uh, fitness devices, if I could develop a fitness device that would make you walk one more hour every single day, that would sound pretty great. And by the way, 
you will have burned an incremental 140 calories, which is exactly one third of a muffin. So I don't mean to criticize, I'm just making the point that you actually have to look at not stuff that is glittery and shiny objects, but what is the stuff that actually delivers the goods? Incentive plans, great idea, they don't work on their own. If you're gonna charge someone a lot more money for being obese, and you're not gonna support them in any other way, effectively what you're gonna have is people who are obese who are, poor, who are more poor than they were than when they started. Because beating somebody by itself is not gonna get the job done. Uh, and there's been a lot of research that's, that's been increasingly showing this to be true. The way forward is all of this stuff. The way forward is combining all of it into comprehensive integrated treatment programs. This isn't that hard to imagine doing. Even better, if you can then take these, these care delivery systems, these integrated care delivery systems around treating obesity and prediabetes, and then integrate them into a healthcare system that is this very, very, very incredibly simple idea of patient sees doctor, doctor says your BMI is 32, your hemoglobin A1Cs are 6.2, you're about five years from becoming diabetic, I'm worried. I'm giving you a referral to this community weight management program. It's covered under your health plan. I want you to check back with me in six months. This doesn't happen today. Unbelievable. It really doesn't happen after all this time because we don't treat obesity like a health condition, effectively like a disease. Now, the AMA made a big statement in saying obesity is a disease. Is it really a disease? Well, I'm sure you could get a bunch of healthcare experts to sort of beat themselves into a bloody pulp debating the fine points of this, but I think the value of that AMA decision was getting people to sort of stop treating obesity as this, this sort of woolly wellness, I'm not quite sure what it is, and to start treating it as a health condition that is worthy of treatment. If nothing else, think of it as treating people who are pre-diabetic as a really useful first step. I don't have any doubt that the collective group within this room and all of the organizations you represent I know that you guys can get together and actually start making progress on this, but the biggest issue I, I see, and I will actually put the biggest burden for this on providers, you have to start. This has to matter, and in a capitated world, you know it will matter because all these pre-diabetic people are gonna be sitting on your rolls and becoming diabetic, and you're gonna be paying an awful lot of money for them, and that's gonna really impact your financial viability and everything else, but the providers have to step forward and if anybody's gonna be the quarterback of having a significant impact on obesity and prediabetes, I honestly believe it's gonna be them. Weight Watchers is an amazing organization. It is a delivery system, but it's kind of like DeVita for weight. You still need the primary care physician as a quarterback in the center of this process, and then you need to build the connective tissue around that, and I hope that at least some of you will take away from that a renewed sense of urgency in making that happen. Thank you.